Hey, everybody. Good morning. Byron Burton here, editorial director of Awards Focus, awards editor, and National Arts Entertainment Journalism Award winner for my work at The Hollywood Reporter. It's a pleasure to speak with a longtime friend, associate, and a big part of the music world here in Los Angeles and around the world, the former COO of the Society of Composers and Lyricists. He's worked with and talked to almost everyone in the business, as well as writing and composing his own tunes. Today, we're talking about The Reef Stalked. Mark Smythe, it's such a pleasure. Hi, Byron. My God, I need I need to learn how to introduce myself with that. That was incredible. How about a C major chord? That's good. The, the Zoom original audio notwithstanding, I thought that was that, that came across pretty well. Um, you know, this film is uh, it's got a nice mix of musical opportunities and it's got a nice mix of trauma. You know, it's a it's a it's a shark film and you expect that the protagonist is going to have that as the biggest thing to contend with. But then this film opens with family tragedy and the character of Nick, she's got a lot going on in her life long before she ever realizes the open waters are going to be a problem. And what I loved about the opening uh, shots were gorgeous, but you have this beautiful paradise sound, uh, this paradise strings, I call it, the little acoustic. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you you put that together and it's got such a unique DNA. It, it uh it, it something I really was drawn to immediately. Can you talk about the lighter side of the score and, and developing that sound? Of course. Yeah, that was, that was one of the uh, more interesting things about this. It's not really a straight horror thriller film at all. There's a whole side story and yes, um, Nick, Nick is going through all sorts of um, psychological uh, dark times during the story but there there are moments where if you didn't know there was a shark looming ahead you're definitely in a tropical paradise um that was interestingly the easier part of scoring this film there was some fairly innocuous temp stuff in those island scenes and the first thing i thought was well we'll need some guitar and we'll need some ukulele which the director thought was harp, and that's fine because means I play the ukulele really well. Well, yeah, I thought. I mean, I didn't know exactly what versions of so many instruments were being used because it was like uh, just a cacophony of beauty, and definitely in the higher timber, you weren't, you know, you weren't in drop D. I knew that much. No, no, this wasn't a heavy metal score. No, I mean, I, I had, um, I had um, ukulele, acoustic guitar, um, was playing bass as well. And if I can extract it here, it might have even sounded a little bit Hawaiian at one point because um, I was using an Evo here, which is how you get those lovely little team slidey high sounds. Um, so... That was really fun, and I hadn't expected to be doing that on a shark film. And no, it created this whole world of, as you say, it was it was a cacophony of beauty, and uh, the aerial shots there, the cinematography in this film is fantastic, especially with the, you know, the overland shots, the underwater shots. Those parts came together really quickly, and it just, you know, growing up in New Zealand, okay, natural scenery, I, I'm I'm on it for this one. Yeah, they were much easier than what was to come later. What's so interesting too is you can play that yourself. So you, you yeah, can, that was all me. You can tell the you can instruct the the musician exactly how you want it. <laughs> yeah, it's like Mark. I think you need another layer of Ebo there. You know, don't go too crazy. Um, there was some piano with delay in the background with some of those bits. Uh, yeah, it was it was really nice to do. It made me wish I was actually there on the island. So much of the uh, the film, you know, like Spielberg learned with Jaws, is it's the suspense that you want to rely on. Yeah, you have to hold that with the music a lot. And yeah, you can't overtake 
the visual you can't be too bombastic so it's a it's a balance of the right synths the right percussive you know lumbering notes here and there to keep you know that sensation while also building it it has to gradually sort of you can't hold so there's the ebb and flow like the waves of the water itself i would say you've done a, a job scoring on that um go through some of those early sequences where they're thinking there might be a shark and then of course we have the the indigenous child that's swimming back to the island and the sibling is stuck on the yeah there there are a lot of scenes like that in the reef stalked and um myself and andrew trowkey the director we we started halfway through the film um because we we, we knew that the um you know the, the the traveling and the island scenes were going to be easier. We worked so hard on creating the right feeling of tension. Um, I started on reel four, uh, which is the scene where um, <clears throat> Kate Lister's character is talking to the younger sister and she's saying, is that the first time you've seen the man in the gray suit, which is what surfers call a shark. And tension was the key word and he was very very fussy about the tension he wanted and there was quite a lot of temp he had in there from certain thriller films that i never want to hear the name of again and that's all i'll say um and it did take me quite a while to get the right feel and the right textures for the tension but once i had it i was on my way and there's some very strange stuff in there um I used a cello bow on my bass guitar. Um, I hired a violinist to make some extraordinarily creepy sounds, um, all sorts of different libraries. And you're right, we had to be so careful not to overdo it. And there's so many, like, big shots of just the water and it's seemingly calm and it's like, okay, we've, we've got to get this right. And we... You know, we really, really honed in on that. And according to the reviews, we got it right. That's that's one of the that's one of the key things that people have said. Like the the tension levels are really, really ominous. Um never got in the way. But there's a lot of it and there's a lot of there's a lot of moments where you think you're about to see a fin and some blood, but it doesn't happen. So yeah. That was key. That was that was key to all of the shark sequences. The finale confrontation with the net, and then one of her comrades gets caught. The idea that they would cut back to the drowning of her sister and that image mm. in her head. Yeah, that's a great choice, and it gives you some opportunity to really deliver a great cue when you have two stories kind of converging in that sense. And Nick size. Yeah. The the flashbacks to the what I called the other side of trauma, they were incredibly frenetic. And that's when I had to pull out my Pandoreski side, as you do. Um Andrew called them spaghetti strings, you know, the mad crazy blah, 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 stuff. It was quite funny. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about at first when he said spaghetti strings. I was like, well, are you are you referencing Ennio Morricone and the good, the bad, and the ugly? What's what's going on here? And finally, I found found the right sound for that, and it was you know madness, chaos, um, and that's in all of the flashbacks. I'm going to be honest. I sometimes wondered if it was too much, but because everything on either side of it was more structured and more musically cohesive, it worked for me. So ultimately, it worked for him. So yeah. Um, Nick, Nick's, Nick's dear departed sister had her own Penderesky theme in the end. And then, of course, the, the crowning achievement, um, the, the beautiful cinematography comes back once again as they, you know, lay down their tribute at the beach and they're all yeah. thinking back and yeah. the shot comes up. It's, you know, the breathtaking landscape. Real estate agents should be asking to source that. <laughs> Yeah, it could be Malibu, right? Yeah, and then you uh, you just create this great closing track. Can you walk us through that process? Did that come very early? Did you want to tackle the end early? When did you set your sights on that? 
Actually, yes, that was that was one of the few cues I did do early. And again, it's 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 very very lush, and there's some real strings in there, and some cheeky samples mixed in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, who cares? You get there in the end. There's some organ, soft piano. Um, there's there's a there's a key melody in there that's on cello. That cue uh, was tapped with a Hans Zimmer cue from Interstellar, <laughs> and. Um, I, I knew I had to get that out of the way early. It was real seven. It was the very last cue, but it's one of the first that I did before I got on, into all the tension and attacks because I focused on the texture of um, Interstellar, which has organ, threw in some organ, and then I was like, okay, that's that's the only thing I'm giving um, giving service to in terms of temp love. Again, it came to me very quickly. Um, it was a D minor theme, which was then interspersed throughout the film with some of the quieter moments between Nick and her younger sister. I was blessed to come up with something good there that he liked immediately. And that was Dive Sisters Forever. Is that the... Dive Sisters Forever. There's a lush, lush cello line there. And the producer was asking me at the end when we were tying up all the admin, he was like, oh, can you, can you please tell me who the cellist was? And I said, well, yeah, that was me playing a sample. Fooled them all, Byron. The greatest trick the devil ever did was convincing him that he wasn't the cello player. <laughs> to That's right. Suspects. Yeah. Satan was not on the music credits. No. Um I love that, and and I just wonder if there's one other cue you'd like to highlight. Uh, you know, I know we talked about uh, the cacophony of beautiful paradise uh, that we did with ukulele and guitar. Yeah, but I really want to talk about Dive Sisters Forever, and if there's one other cue you would like to highlight, I hope that uh, our audience will check those out. Yes, um, no more paddling. It's track sixteen on the soundtrack. Um, it's um, it's somewhere in between the ocean beauty, but also the the inexorable tension. Um, it's towards the end of the final act of the film, and it's when Nick, who until that point has um, looked extremely uncomfortable out on the ocean, and just like totally freaking out, almost losing the plot many times. And then she has a steely look and she says to the others, no, no more paddling. We have to kill it. And um, it's it's just a slow build of a cue. Um, slow, incredibly uh, dark strings and then just some tribal percussion building underneath. And it's my favorite moment of the score because it it ends with this huge drum roll and then just this vast shot of the ocean with the spare kayak that they've rigged up to hopefully trap the shark. And uh, I saw this film a couple of times in cinemas um, in Lamley Glendale, and that moment gave me goosebumps. I was like, okay, you did that, buddy. You've got a chance. That was legit. That's a rare moment of vulnerability for the Zelda-wearing Mark Smythe. That's a beautiful thing. To you know, I didn't even know this was Zelda, and I was hosting a and a years ago for the SCL, and the YouTube chat went nuts. Oh, it's Mark wearing a Zelda T-shirt. So I can't, I can't, can't claim to be cool at all there, but well, I can't change the angle so you see it more. For all of our SCL friends, Mark will be talking later today there, and of course, by the time you see this video, you can listen to Mark's conversation with Chris from the SCL uh, on our website. It will be logged there for eternity. So please check it out. Please consider. The Reef Stocked for SCL's 2023 awards. Correct. The fourth annual. Fourth annual. Yeah. yeah. I'm so excited to be 
throwing my hat in the ring or my my shark into the water, however you want to describe it. Yeah. It's exciting. You've been on every side of it now. It's, it's I have been. I, I much prefer being on this side, but I'm also, um, I'm, I'm so happy that I was sort of in the trenches on the other side of everything because that's how I got to know a lot of really, really nice people. If I was going to quote Don Johnson from Miami Vice, as you always want to do when you're finally in an interview with the great Byron Burton, I'm just a simple man in a sea of sharks. <laughs> That's perfect. And thank you for the, uh, the kind remarks. Mark Smythe, thank you so much for giving us your time today, talking the reef stalked, your diverse score on the ocean. Many have done it before, but none have done it like you, sir. You found a way to carve a niche spot for yourself with a nice, versatile sound palette. So congratulations. I thoroughly enjoyed talking with you, thoroughly enjoyed watching the film. Thank you, sir. And yes, thank God I got away with it. <laughs>